We all know what it's like to be a member of a team, being with your friends and trusting them to show you how to do things properly. But what is a team? It is a group of people of different abilities and skills, all of whom come together with a common purpose. That's what it's like in the railways today. It's one big team. It doesn't matter if you're the newest recruit or a very experienced manager, whether you lead or follow. You're a valuable member of one of the biggest teams in the country. So let's take a look at the railways and the teams that have made it what it is today. Right from the very beginning, the railways needed teams of men to build it. They worked very hard, and it was a dangerous life. As someone who wrote about it at the time said, As far as the eye can range, one immense chasm appears before the observer. It was executed by means of a number of horse runs, so called by excavators from the men being drawn up planks by horses. While the excavator takes firm hold of the handles, both man and barrow are drawn up the plank, the body nearly horizontal during the ascent. It is a fearful practice. A dangerous life indeed, but if the teams had not worked as well as they had, there would not be the railway system as good as it is today. The first lines were opened in the middle of the 1800s and spread all over the country. All the first trains were pulled by steam locomotives. People and goods could now easily travel all over the country, north to south, east to west. The railways enjoyed great success. They grew and developed, serving the country well for 70 years or so but they could not keep pace with the changing needs of the nation. Things had to change. The decline had to stop. Over a hundred years after they began, it was decided to rethink the railway system. The task of making it more profitable fell to Dr. Richard Beeching, the then chairman of the British Railways Board. In proposing the uh, closing down of stations and services, we are only recommending the continuation of a process that's gone on for some time. The railways, for many years now, have been losing traffic to uh, road vehicles, to the private car, to the bus, and to the lorry. And in the country areas, it's doubtful whether the railways carry as much as 10% of the traffic that there is. In areas like East Anglia and Wales and the West Country and in the North and away into Scotland, there is very little traffic indeed. His proposals were to cut out 5,000 miles of uneconomic track throughout the country. This was to prove a very difficult and unpopular decision. But... It offers us the prospect of being able to cut out a very large part of the route mileage with a very high cost associated with it and still keep 95% of the traffic on what is left. The Beeching plan revolutionised the railways and formed the basis of the system we have today. Despite being cut by nearly 35%, the railway is still big. You can still travel by train from Wick on the top of Scotland to Penzance in the Tower of England. To make it even more efficient, in 1980, the railway was split into business sectors. Sea Link, together with the chain of railway hotels, was sold as part of the restructuring. The seven new sectors of the railways became Intercity, Network Southeast, 
and regional railways, which are concerned with carrying passengers, and rail freight distribution, trainload freight, Red Star parcels, and rail express systems carrying heavy goods and parcels. But there are many other sectors of the railways which keep it working, like designers who now work with computer-aided design systems, civil engineers to build and maintain the track, bridges and tunnels, and mechanical engineers to maintain the trains and carriages. Signal and telecommunications engineers design the modern signal boxes and see that the signals and the telephone systems keep working. And there are many others in the background. Electronics engineers, doctors, electricians and policemen, solicitors, draftsmen and painters, all part of the team working for the railways. Intercity provides luxury long-distance passenger services to major cities throughout the country. Travelling at 125 miles an hour, the high-speed train was introduced in 1975. Now, Intercity has even faster trains, which can travel up to 225 kilometres or 140 miles an hour. Passengers travelling in today's intercity trains have every modern facility in air-conditioned comfort. This wooden mock-up is part of the early design stages of the passenger train of tomorrow. Network Southeast, on the other hand, have trains which do not travel as fast, but they are the most modern trains for the very important job they do. Network Southeast carries nearly 600,000 people every day to and from work in southern England. It does this so well that in the rush hours a commuter train arrives at one of the London terminal stations every 11 seconds. During the rest of the day, the trains are washed and stations are cleaned. Cheap fares are available for days out. The system then prepares to take the commuters home in the evening. Network Southeast continues to improve passenger comfort and convenience by designing new trains which are lighter, cheaper to produce, and more energy efficient. To do its job more effectively, Network Southeast is divided into nine smaller divisions. This enables managers to get closer to and to cater for local needs. Each division looks after itself and is responsible for every aspect of providing the train service. The third passenger business is regional railways, which provides passenger services for the rest of the country. The new trains, like this one, are designed to cater for some journeys as short as those found on Network Southeast, and others as long as you would find on Intercity.
With top speeds up to 90 miles an hour, they are very comfortable with toilets, telephone, facilities for mothers and babies, and a trolley service. From moving people to moving goods and heavy freight. The freight business of British Rail is complex and is split into two parts. Rail freight distribution and trainload freight. The trainload freight business is formed to move raw materials quickly and economically. Petroleum, chemicals, coal and minerals are all carried. Trainload freight helps keep heavy lorries off Britain's roads and plays its part in reducing pollution. There are many customers whose business relies on this service, like this one on the northeast coast of England. Our main movement is raw material flow from Immingham, where we have a bulk terminal discharge facility for raw material of iron ore and coal coming through to the Scunthorpe Works here. Total tonnage of, of ore amounts to five million tons and coal two and a half million tons which really means that the obvious route for that material is to come by rail. For each of the different forms of freight there is a different division. Rail freight distribution not only serves the United Kingdom but it also delivers its freight throughout Europe. It specializes in carrying containers the freight carried includes chemicals and minerals and cars. The containers are moved to and from the trains by lorries and are lifted onto the train by huge cranes. Sometimes the containers are lifted onto special ships to be taken all over the world. Moving containers throughout the country and Europe goes on all day and all night. With the coming of the Channel Tunnel, rail freight is finding a growing market throughout the whole of Europe. The Rail Express Parcels Division was formed in 1991 to handle high-speed movement of magazines, parcels and letters. Its biggest customer is the Royal Mail, which still has travelling post offices where letters are sorted during the journey. So that's what the railways do, carry people and freight across the country. A different railway today to that of Robert Stevenson, who built the first railway.